You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, get out, Get the point. Good. And now... Send Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Yeah, it's magic. It's magic. I won't say the rest just yet because I'm not ready to drop that bomb just yet. But I do have an inquiring minds kind of question. Who is Ben and is he really from Dover? Hmm. All kinds of fun little wackadoodle stuff tonight on Wacka 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 Wackadoodle Wednesday edition of Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com channel 10. Also on the RLM Spreaker channel. And by the way, if you're listening in on Spreaker and you're wanting to give me some titty chats, sorry, hon, I got really crappy internet out here in the boonies. I mean, I I am seriously way out here in the boonies. But if you want to chat with me, come on over to reallibertymedia.com. Think of a nickname. Join the chat. Give me some static. I'll give it back. Hell, you may even hear some static on the radio. God only knows. It's a tin can, kite string, and duct tape. You know, what do you expect? And I'm some wackadoodle old lady that just kind of has a good time being goofy and calling out the BS because there's an awful lot of Moon BS going on. A lot of whining going on today, too. Lots of magic. They live in their special little bubbles. <laughs> oh, well. We're also on the RLM tune in radio station, the RLM uh, internet radio station, and RLM radio.xyz site. Plus, going to be later on uh, YouTube and BitChute. So, yeah, I'm infecting the airwaves. <laughs> I love it. And you know what? Tomorrow is Thanksgiving Day here in the United States. Something to be thankful for. I'll give you something to be thankful for. You're alive and breathing. There's something to be thankful for. You ought to be thankful for that every day. You ought to find at least one thing every day to be thankful for. Even if it's just the fact that you're thankful that you're not somebody else. There's something to be thankful for. You get that attitude of gratitude going and let me tell you the world will be a different place. Yeah, because the rain has lasted for over a thousand years of this nasty diabolical crap and it's time to move on. Time to step up. Time to evolve, people. But in the interim, I have a link that I got from Grimner. I, yeah, I'm, I'm very good at stealing links. <laughs> and this one is from RT.com. And, uh, oh, you know what? I think before I do that, I'm, I'm, I'm mature blonde today. <laughs> I probably ought to say hey there, hi there, ho there to everybody, shouldn't I? Over here on Twitter. Thank you, Barman, for tweeting me out and letting me know. And thank you, Jeremiah Harding, for the link that I'm going to get to later on this evening. Um, but thank you, Barman, for tweeting me out. And also, hey there, hi there, ho there to you too, BB uh, Blackbird, BB9. Oh, my God. I've got more notifications than I can shake a stick at. And guess what, Grimmy? Uh, RealLiberty.org just might get inundated because there's people that are pissed off that uh, Laura Loomer, is that her name, um, got the permanent boot, apparently, from Twitter. And... Uh, they were saying they were going to delete their Twitter account. So I I just, you know, put in there, come on over to realliberty.org. <laughs> so I've got 17, 18 people so far that have liked that. So don't be surprised if we don't get some new people over there on realliberty.org. Would be awesome. Hey, Vinny, I see you over here on Twitter too. Thank you, hon. For uh, liking that tweet I was mentioned in. You so awesome, Vinny. Oh, Vinny's easy, you know. Yeah, I'm not easy, but I can be tricked. But yeah, Vinny's easy. Yeah, uh, here it is. Laura Loomer banned from Twitter after criticizing 
um, someone of the Muslim persuasion and Sharia law. Well, hmm. I guess Twitter really doesn't want our business. And I, you know, when I shared that, I put on there that, um, you know, she got labeled as a big old meanie poo poo head. And I think she should wear that label proudly. You big old meanie poo poo head, you made them go to a safe space. Oh, darn. Oh, yeah. I feel so bad for them. <laughs> Not. Hey, Juan Ataco, I see you too. Okay, Twitter. Um, I said, hey, oh, holy crap, I got more followers too. <laughs> I'm not used to all this notoriety. I got three new people today. Holy crap. I know. It's the little things in life. Moving along. Over here on, uh, where am I at? Fakie book. Hey there, Linda. How are you doing, sweetheart? Um, oh, I love you too, Vinny. You're such a goof. I also see Phil is over here. And I also got some very sad news yesterday. A classmate of mine passed away. He had a heart attack. And it's like, oh, man, he was one of the few classmates that I actually got along with. He's a lot of fun. I will catch you on the other side, Doug. Get that place ready for me. Get the party started, okay, darling? I'd appreciate it. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. where am I at? Where am I at? Okay, there am I at. Hey, Rob Works just joined in too. Sweet. Okay, I am able to get on freedomsnetwork.com. Booyah! I was having internet issues and computer issues last week, in case you couldn't tell from my freaking last show I did. Wow. Wow. F-bombs be, yeah. Yoinks. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. Over here on Freedoms Network, thank you, Grimmy, for letting everybody know that I am live and in poison. I also see Late In is on here, as well as Majutur South, and Cowboy Tech was here a little while ago. Yeah. Um, if government doesn't behave, I will put my ballot in the box and I will beg for a new ruler. I will do this because that I am a good person and that is how I roll. Not. I haven't done that for a long. I I have to admit I used to, but I don't no more. Cause it's like why bother? Why bother? It's all a selection. They put those. They are the ones that decide who you get to choose from. What the hell? Why bother? Cause it's already pretty much decided. I mean, yeah, someone might throw a monkey wrench in there, like with trumples. <laughs> oh, I'm really starting to enjoy this. I know, I'm sick and demented, but I really am starting to enjoy this. In any case, over here on realliberty.org, R-L-O. Hey there, Grim. Thank you for uh, sharing it out and letting everybody know that I am live right now over here. I also see Bryant is over here as well as Bob Renner. Uh, Mary B was on for a little bit and so was late in and Rob Works was on here a while ago and so was Cowboy Tech. Lots and lots of people were, and we've got, Excuse me, hick burp, cha cha cha. Oh, let me scroll down because I want to see how many people we got. 92. Booyah. I also see Gary L was over here for a while. Okay, moving along. Over here on Minds, once again, thank you again, Real Liberty Media, for uh, letting everybody know over here on Minds that I am on. Thank you ever so much. Yeah. Um, wow. The media isn't journalism. It's public relations for the government and corporations. Journalism is printing something that someone doesn't want printed. That's pretty much a very good definition of journalism. Yeah. Don't have that crap anymore. No, we don't. At least not in the corporate lame ass propaganda system. Thank you, Grim, once again for that little ditty there. So... Now I need to get over to the chats where you need to be if you want to give me some static and I will hopefully see it and go, <gasps> yeehaw. Ooh, Frumpy, did you duct tape your parts? That's not good. Ah, ah, ow. Huh. Oh, all part of the plan. Yeah, well, yeah, but it is, it is entertaining, Grim. I got to tell you that. Wow. 
I got notifications. Noters. <laughs> Let me check, see what's going on. Hey, Gary L., I see you over here on realliberty.org. Okay, now, if you're over in the RLM chat, which is really kind of where you need to be. <coughs> Excuse me. I've been playing in the dust today. I went over and cleaned my uncle's house, and I hadn't done that for a month, and wow. You could tell I hadn't done that for a month. I've been a busy girl. In any case, Trump may be a monkey, but I don't think he's a wrench. Moving along. So, right up top, I see Barman, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world. I also see Grimner, who is the RLM god, don't you know? Closely followed by the lovely Moose Coil. Hey, Moosey, how's life going in your neck of the woods? Um, yeah, that's right. I wonder who the organ grinder is, Grimmy. If he's the monkey, who's the organ grinder? <laughs> Moving along. Hi, Kate. How are you doing, lady? I also see Asmo. Hi, Asmo. Long time no see in the chitty chat. You just logged in. I also see Chalcedony as well as the lovely Chloe. D underscore C. Hi, Don. Echelon is also here. Oh, the Foo Fighters said so. I do enjoy the Foo Fighters. Yes, I do. I'm I'm reading the chat, by the way. Easily distracted. There you go, Vinny. I said easily, too. Um, <laughs> hi, Gooberzilla. Goober is officially not going to have Godzilla tail for Turkey Day. I don't blame you, hun. Have you ever had a piece of that tail? Man, it's got a whip to it. I'm here, kind of, sort of. I be Don C. Is also, there's my mother calling again. She always calls on Wednesdays when I'm on the radio. And then she leaves me a voicemail. Is this Wednesday? I forgot. <laughs> Bless her heart. She's so funny. I mean, cripes. You know, she's 87 and she's had 10 kids and let us all live past puberty to give her grandkids. Uh, I think that's pretty much the reason why she let us live, basically. In any case, uh, da -da -da -da, where am I at? Meister Brower. Hey, Woody, how you doing? I also see a double pox in the chat box. Poxified and poxophone. Got some pompa pompa ponsos going on in the chat, as well as the lovely Rain. Hi, Rain. RLM Fluke, the Vanna White of the RLM channel, is also here. Oh, gross, Graham. That's just gross. Wiener, the organ grinder. <laughs> My mind went, whew. oh, moving along. Wow, I, I need some mental bleach. Where's my mental Etch-A-Sketch when I need it? I haven't perfected it yet. Uh, let's see, Rob Oikes is here. Rob, did you fire up the bubbler, hun? I do not see a bubbler. Where's a bubbler? Tiny bubbles with my wine. I'll be getting to some of that whiny stuff here in just a little bit. Um, Rome's is here. Hey, Rome's. Guess what? We're both kind of sort of in the same occupation now. Although you you do your thing and I do pretty much everything. Okay, I don't do the like the maintenance stuff. Thank you, Rob. I see you fired up the bubbler. Booyah! You're so awesome. Um. But yeah, we're both in the hotel business now. <laughs> Moving along. Um, uh, do a <laughs> I should. I should do Lily Tomlin with Mom on. Mom. Mom would freeze. She would. T she. Are you recording this? <laughs> yes, Mom. One ringy dingy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she would just. Cause we always do the hello, mother. Hello, daughter. Oh, well. Uh, where am I at? <laughs> Besides sitting right here being goofy. Phantom! Hi, Phantom. Phantom's the one that did my awesome intro. Once again, thank you, dude, until you're better paid. I love you. I really do love you, man. I also see Beetle! Hi, Beetle! I hope you're giving Pippi some good scratchings. Pippi needs scratchings. Colfax 101 is also here, as well as Cyborg Noodle. May you be touched by his cyborgian noodliness. Dakota. Hi, Dakota. Is it cold up in them our hills? Frumpy's here. Hi, Frumpy. Gromit is also here, as well as Java, 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 Java Doctor 2. And looky there, JJ's all the way from Scotland. I'll bet he's wearing a long kilt this time of year. Hey, Kozu, how are you doing, sweetheart? 
I also see Skittle is here. Yay, Skittle. And looky there, Slim Jim Flim. Haven't seen Slim Jim for a while. He hasn't chatted much that I have seen today, but then I've been in and out, so, you know, what the hey. And Vinnyville. Vinny lives in Vinnyville, which is rather appropriate because, yeah, Vinny's pretty much, yeah. There you go. Now, over here in the red pill, I see D underscore C as well as I B Don C. Apostle is also logged in as well as Barman, the lovely Beth Z. Hi, Dakota. He's over here too, as well as Echelon and F Canella. I'm here. Grim's here. Java Doctor 2 is here. Juana Taco. Katie Troxel, the lovely Moose Coil. QFTW, RLM Fluke, Rob Works, and Surly, who's got a massive underscore going on. Underscore. So, let's see. What shall I get to first? I think I will get to, it's magic. Fuck you. <laughs> I had to. I had to. Where's my pocket? There's my pocket. Okay. Thank you, Grim. For this wonderful RT. I don't know how wonderful it is. Other than I saw the guy doing the magic trick. And he was making toilet paper. And you know with so much shit flying. We're going to need an awful lot of toilet paper. You know, there are some people that I can't decide. If I want to hand them toilet paper. Or a napkin to wipe the corners of their mouth. Because whee. It's coming out of both ends. So. While it's at. Oh nope. Don't want to see that. So, from RT.com, some kind of magic. Yeah, there's a Moscow legislator who proposed to blacklist phony wizards. Well, Harry Potter, you better look out. Apparently, a Moscow city legislator has come up with an idea to create a publicly available blacklist of phony wizards. While legit warlocks should get together and form a trade union of sorts. Now, the uh, quite outstanding initiative has been floated by a deputy with the Moscow City Duma, Anton Pev Pavlev. Pavlev. There you go. Uh, ooh, uh, ooh, what? What? What did I say? Um, Yuhumo. I didn't know you were. <laughs> oh, okay. Moving along. So, oh, click the wrong thing. So, <clears throat> a professional association of them, such as mages, should emerge to tell people or tell normal people from fraudsters. It will publish such data on the website as other communities do. This is what Paliv told Moskva News Agency on Tuesday, citing existing unions of sports enthusiasts and quest game organizers as examples. Now, I believe that there are many warlocks, mages, wizards, and parapsychologists in Moscow. A professional association is needed, he stressed. You know, I know quite a few witches myself, but they're not necessarily, well, a list would be handy, so you could avoid them. But other than that, um, <laughs> oh, there's a little side link in here that says, uh, magician's 350 year old get women naked spell sells for 25 or $28,000. Wow. Wow, that's, that's someone with way too much money and too much time on their hands, and apparently their hands are not looking so good anymore. <laughs> Whoa. Moving along with this article. Apparently it remains unclear how exactly the legislator would tell legit mages from the phony ones to create the association in the first place. His initiative contains some rational ideas as well. Since the legislator suggested that the magical activities should receive some legal evaluation. Oh God, here we go with the legal schmeagle shit. Now, the wizardry, fortune telling, and other quite questionable services are actually quite a large market in Russia, which is, however, hardly re uh, regulated. Well, 
don't regulate it just let the buyer beware you know if you if you buy a make women get naked um spell and it don't work honey i'm thinking there's a sucker born every minute and you just proved that you are one just saying this goes on to say the deputy however believes that such an initiative should come from the magic community itself since authorities cannot arbitrarily catch everyone and throw them behind bars well you know and if they're magical beings how are you going to keep them behind bars I mean, can't they just magic themselves out? I would think so. Now, the wizards themselves, however, seem to be quite reluctant to create a trade union, with some suggesting that the bureaucrats are actually up to their own magic tricks. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm against such white lists, since only fraudster mages will get on them. That's from Anastasia, a wizard who told... Uh, told that to life.ru one who pays up will instantly become a good one yeah money money talks and bullshit walks but magic comes with fancy unicorns now proving magical services is a profitable if questionable business mainly preying on desperate people hence the 28 grand for the mech women get naked spell back in august for example a woman from moscow region filed a complaint to law enforcement after she paid a wizard the hefty sum of 5.8 million rubles or nearly ninety thousand dollars to cure her husband's cancer now, while the man purported to be a hereditary warlock of the 12th generation, his treatment, unsurprisingly, had no effect. Sweetie, if he was a true healer, true healers don't charge for that, hun. That should have been your first clue. Okay? True healers know that that's bad juju to charge for such things. Wow. But it's magic. Fuck you. What's that? Copper pepper, cop pepper sprays young girl. Oh, yeah. The, mm, mm, they have the magic star. Therefore, they can do these things. Just ask them. They'll tell you. I. Oh, well. Let me put this over here on the effing site because guess what? I can do this and the effing site makes it so much easier because all I have to do is find a way cool emoticon and I can booyah. It's magic. I like that because I can be lazy. And then when I'm done with the radio, then I can do the sharing everywhere else. But I ain't sharing, cheering right now. So... Where's, I know there's a wizardy guy, or I thought there was a wizardy guy. Maybe there isn't. Maybe there's just a, booyah, it's magic. Hey, I have an idea. Hey, let me see. Or maybe not. Maybe it's just, hmm, dang it. I thought I had magics. That's what I get for having an independent thought, by gosh and by golly. Okay. I'm still scrolling because I'm still looking because you never know. It might be there. And then again, it might not. Hmm. Apparently not. So. <coughs> Excuse me. Dang it. Hi, Bo. I see you. I see you. Hi, Bobby. I see you over here on realliberty.org. How are you doing, sweetheart? Yeah, I know. I wish we had a shout box over here on Real Liberty. That would be so freaking awesome. Have a shout box on here. And if you're listening, hon, that would be absolutely amazing. Amazing. Okay. Speaking of amazing. Amazing. Um, do I want to go that one? Yeah. I'm shocked. I'm shocked and appalled. No, my name is not Paul. I'm just shocked and appalled. 
Oh, you know what? I could probably put this over here too. I'll just, there you go. We do that. And loop de loo, my ba little sister. My little sister. One of my little sisters. I don't remember if I posted that or not, so I just posted it again. So there you go. Um, this is from breaking911.com. Voter fraud scheme. Prosecutors say homeless offered cash, cigar and cigarettes in exchange for hundreds of signatures. No, say it ain't so. Vote harder, though. In Los Angeles, prosecutors have charged nine people with a dozen felony counts for allegedly offering money and smokes to homeless people on Skid Row in exchange for false and forged signatures on ballot petitions and voter registration forms. This is according to the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. Now, the charges include circulating a petition with false names, use of false names on a petition, voter fraud, I thought that was a, apparently not, voter fraud, registering a fictitious person, and voter fraud, registering a non-existent person. Are you not going to do voter fraud, registering a dead person? You know, that's where most, most people, when they pass on to the great beyond, they don't realize that they become Democrats. They do. It's scary. My suggestion, don't pass on. <laughs> Unless you're a Democrat, and then it's not going to be much of a change for you. <laughs> now, the defendants are accused with engaging in the solicitation of hundreds of false and or forged signatures on state ballot petitions and voter registration forms by allegedly offering homeless people $1 and or cigarettes for their participation. Cheap asses. Apparently, this occurred during the 2016 and 2018 election cycles. Hmm. Now, charged in the cr criminal complaint are Kirkland Kuzova, Kirkland Kuzova, Washington, Harold Bennett, and Lewis Thomas Wise, who each face eight counts and they all face a maximum state prison sentence of six years and four months if convicted as charged, which, guess what? They get to live on the taxpayer's dime. Although it's really not the taxpayer's dime because that, that dime just don't go near as far as it used to. Also charged are Richard Howard, Rose Makita Sweeney, Christopher Joseph Williams, Jakara Fatih, Mardis, Norman Hall, and Nikki Demulvin Huntley, who each face four counts. If convicted as charged, the defendants face a maximum sentence of four years and eight months in state prison. Now, the prosecutors have recommended that bail be set at 25000 for each defendant. The case remains under investigation by the Los Angeles Police Department and the FBI's Los Angeles Field Department. Hmm, hmm, your tax dollars at work, doesn't that make you feel comfortable? It's not going to change anything, but, yeah. Anarchism claim? Hmm? Um... Hmm, <laughs> What are you? Oh, okay. Moving along. Moving along. I probably ought to put that in here too. Yeah. I'm. I'm just. I'm linking everywhere. Linking. Link. Good thing I'm not leaking. <laughs> that would not be cool. Okay. Let me put this over in the effing site. And then I have another one for all of those that are, you know, a little on the timid side. You know, easily frightened. This one, it, this next one will be for you. Because, yeah, it's life is scary sometimes. It really is. Okay. We'll do those three. I voted. No, I didn't. Okay. 
This one is from the activistpost.com. Professors warned not to frighten university students by using all caps. Yeah. So when you shout at people like that in papers or on the interwebs, you're scaring people. Stop it. This is by Daisy Luther. So does this scare you, all caps? According to leading research in the UK, using all caps in university instructions could frighten students into failure. <laughs> I'm scared. I need my binky and my thumb. Where's my binky? Mm -hmm. Now, the staff at Leeds Trinity School was given a handful of instructions to help the future journalists of the United... <laughs> Future journalists, you gotta be shitting me. <clears throat> Future journalists of the United Kingdom succeed. They're not going to be succeeding in journalism unless they go to the Jim Acosta School of Oh, yeah, let me in. Let me in, you big old meanie poo poo head. Ah. A few low lights or highlights of the internal document obtained by Express UK. Yeah, don't worry. The document does not contain any frightening all caps. But the staff at Leeds Trinity School of Journalism has also been told to write in a helpful, warm tone, avoiding officious language and negative instructions. Some blasted the move as more academic mollycoddling of the snowflake generation. An enhancing student understanding, engagement, and achievement memo lists do's and don'ts with do and don't among words frowned upon. So we highly recommend that you try this. And we seriously frown upon you using this. How does that sound? I'd much rather write do and don't. Now, course leaders say capitalizing a word would emphasize the difficulty or high-stakes nature of the task. The memo says, despite our best attempts to explain assessment tasks, any lack of clarity can generate anxiety and even discourage students from attempting the assessment at all. Oh, yeah. So the memo also says that staff must be, what a minute, well, wait, that's must, that's an intimidating word. That's, to me, that's more intimidating than do or don't. Because do and don't are suggestive. Must is compelling. I don't like that. I need, I need to go to my blanky fort. Where's my crayons? Don't eat the purple ones because they don't taste like grape. <laughs> Apparently, it says that we must be explicit about any implicitness. Dang, using those big words, too. Mm. Yeah, I'm supposed to be using this in their assessment briefs. And, and it warns that when students are unsure of an assessment, they often talk to each other, and any misconceptions or misunderstandings quickly spread throughout the group, usually aided and abetted by fake book. No, say it isn't so. Nonsense and frivolity and hurt feelings being passed around on fake book? Say it ain't so. Apparently, this can lead to further confusion, and the students may even then decide that the assessment is just too difficult and not attempt it. Now, the university said that the guidance was sharing best practice from the latest teaching research, adding that we take pride in supporting our students to be the very best that they can be. Well, if you want to support them to be the very best that they can be, please be specific, because this sounds like you're, you're supporting them to be the very best whiny wanker doodle out there. <laughs> Use caps on me. <laughs> Mommy, that's almost as bad as the red ink pen. <laughs> yeah. It would be difficult to be surprised by this. 
After all, we live in a world in which clapping has been banned and replaced with jazz hands to avoid the potential of anxiety for students. You know, and, well, it's kind of discriminatory against those who are deaf. Uh (laughs) We live in a world with coloring books, puppies, and safe spaces for college students who require a respite from the world with Donald Trump in it. We live in a world where a Harvard, where a professor at Harvard Law, yeah, Harvard freaking Law, which, sorry, that's all caps, I hope you're okay, is dealing with law students who believe that rape law should not be taught. Yeah, we live in a world in which practically everything must be prefaced with a trigger warning. Uh, Last I knew, trigger was something either on a gun, oh, somebody just got triggered, or trigger was a horse. I mean, seriously, if you're going to get triggered and go off, please do so responsibly. How about we have some emotion control instead of gun control? Let's focus on that one for a while. Yes, unfortunately, we live in a world in which anything that goes against the official rhetoric of the big tech god is immediately censored out. All of this coddling comes at a high price for mental health because the mental health of young people is truly suffering. And it isn't because the words are all caps. Greg Lukanoff and Jonathan Haidt of the Atlantic wrote about harm being caused by the political correctness epidemic. Yeah, I can believe that. It presumes an extraordinary fragility of the collegiate psyche. Crime any Christmas, three-year-olds aren't as fragile. Oh, and therefore it elevates the goal of protecting students from psychological harm. The ultimate aim, it seems, is to turn campuses into safe spaces where young adults are shielded from words and ideas that make some of them uncomfortable. And more than the last, this movement seeks to punish anyone who interferes with that aim, even accidentally. I know you don't understand that you just said a word that triggered me emotionally, but now you must die. Or at least go to social media hell. Whichever is worse. Mm. Yeah. Now, you might call this impulse vindictive protectiveness. And it is creating a culture in which everyone must think twice before speaking up. Lest they fa- <coughs> excuse me, face charges of insensitivity or aggression or worse. Oh my God, if the worst thing I ever commit in this world is insensitivity, damn, I'm thinking I'm getting through this life cycle in a slam dunk. Now, what are the effects of this new protectiveness on the students themselves? Does it benefit the people it is supposed to help? Uh-uh. What exactly are students learning when they spend four hours or more in a community that polices unintentional slights, places warning labels on works of classic literature, and in many other ways conveys the sense that words can be forms of violence that require strict control by campus authorities, who are expected to act as both protectors and prosecutors. It's the thought police. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. I know triggers a very scary word, Grimmy. I know it is, but you know what? Somebody's just going to have to deal with it. So, vindictive protective protectiveness teaches students to think in a very different way. It prepares them poorly for professional life, which often demands intellectual engagement with people and ideas one might find uncongenial or wrong. Oh my God, don't tell me I'm wrong. I got to go to my safe space. Yeah. Now the harm may be more immediate too. 
The campus culture devoted to policing or policing speech and punishing speakers is likely to engender patterns of thought that are surprisingly similar to those long identified by cognitive behavioral therapists as causes of depression and anxiety. So the new protectiveness may be teaching students to think pathologically. Well, because you just plain can't have enough pathological idiots out there. And you know what? It is so true. If you can't withstand words that you don't like, how will you withstand the cold, hard world of the workforce? How will you deal with financial problems or divorce or even sassy offspring? Lord, Lord, both of mine were sassy. Holy crap. I wonder where they got that from. <laughs> yeah, you know, when we were kids, we used to say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never harm me. What happened to that? What happened to that? I know people can use words to manipulate your th thought process, but seriously, sticks and stones, peeps. Now imagine a shit hit the fan event with these kids in the starring roles. <laughs> they won't feed me. They won't protect me. They won't do anything. I'm going to go cuddle over here in a corner and just cry. You need to save me from myself. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. If you will, take a moment to imagine the kind of thing for which we are all preparing. Some sort of societal breakdown. Now add to the chaos these young people who have been coddled, nurtured, and inoculated with viral political correctness. How will they possibly deal with the chaos that Selko describes in his shocking book about the reality of a shit-hit-the-fan environment? Will they demand their human right to food while shrouded in a, in a weighted anxiety-reducing blanket? <laughs> get out from under your blanket and get it yourself, darling. Will they color while the building they are in is being shelled? Probably because special little crayons make the bombs go away. How would they muster up the wherewithal to fight back and protect themselves if they've never dealt with even a modicum of violence in their sheltered lives? And sorry... But people exercising their free speech is not what I classify as violence. Not unless they follow up on those words with harmful intent. Now, it would be utter chaos. You've got to admit this. Bloody mayhem. They'll be fodder for the psychopaths who are not so politically correct. And it's a terrible disservice that's been done to these young people. And seriously, you really do have to stop and think. And I actually pity them. Because, uh, what's that line from the Bible? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. They really don't. They think, they really be live that you shouldn't talk mean to them. You shouldn't say things that give them an emotional boo-boo or a butt hurt. <laughs> Guess what, darling? Yeah. <clears throat> In closing, she goes on to say, if you think I'm exaggerating, please remember, I'm talking about kids who are scared of words typed in all caps. Heaven forbid we ever face an invading force of young adults who have not been babied into incom in incapability. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Seriously, people, stop coddling them. My Lord, I don't even coddle my grandkids. I mean, you know, if they're being little poo-poo heads, I let them know. You know, y'all need to pull your head out because this kind of behavior is not acceptable. Not And I have used stronger language than that as well with my grandchildren when they deserve it. So, I don't drop F-bombs on them. That's just rude. Because they are kids. Although some of the jokes that they have told me lately is like, 
wow, at your age, I had no freaking clue. Holy crap. <sighs> okay. Where's the, where's the little emoticon? I need that one. I need the big crybaby. I know he's here. I've seen him. I've seen him be a big old crybaby. I know I've seen that one. Okay, scrolling, scrolling. There it is. There it is. I knew I saw it. Okay. Thank you, Grimmy. I really do love these emoticons. They make life so much easier for me when I'm sharing links. Okay, back to my pocket I go, because I do have a few other things. You know, just to, because it is, it's a freaking whack-a-doodle, whack-a-doodle Wednesday. And if this ain't wackadoodle, man. So, this is from uh, hideoutnow.com. I believe Rob Works probably shared this one earlier today. Official demands teacher not culturally appropriate Native Americans on Thanksgiving. Ruh-roh. Apparently, Lauren Mascaren. Mascarenas is a director of equity for North Carolina's Wake County public school system. Why do they need a director of equity? I'm thinking Lauren could not get a job elsewhere and so someone created a position. Is this the kind of positions we're going to have those little molly collied babies put in? Wow. She had strong words for teachers leading up to this year's Thanksgiving holiday. Teachers, repeat after me. I will not have my students make Indian feathers clothes. I will not culturally, culturally appropriate an entire people for cute activities. I will tell my students the truth about this country's relationship with indigenous people. Sweetheart, do you know the truth? Because pre you can look at pretty much any history book out there and just assume just just assume, and I know assuming makes an ass out of you and me, but you can just kind of pretty much go with the odds that minimum, minimum, 50% of it is lies. Used to make someone else feel not quite so bad about their behavior during a certain time in history. Or their buddy's behavior during a certain time in history. I was having a little chit chat with my uncle while uh, when I was getting ready to leave, and he told me that the dentist um, had told him he was pretty impressed because last time I was at the dentist, we had talked about the Holocaust and and the gas chambers and all of that other fun stuff that supposedly went on. And uh, I pretty much explained to him that seriously, if they'd had all that stuff that they were accused of doing, not saying, not saying that there weren't diabolical acts carried out, but not, it's not what you were told, most definitely not what you were told, but I'd explained to the dentist that, do you not think that those um, noxious fumes would have permeated the concrete walls where these people were supposedly gassed, and do you not think that the people that went into those rooms when they were liberated without gas masks, do you think maybe they would have at least gotten sick, if not died? Do you, I want to know, where the hell did they get the fuel for the um, um, burning up all of these people that they supposedly burned up in the ovens? Where'd they get the fuel? Because, you know, the Allies cut off the supply lines, so they had no fuel. They had no food. No wonder everybody was emaciated when they went and liberated those camps. Stop and think for a minute. Usa told you a story, its story, his story, in order to make it sound as though they were the good guys. But they were not such good guys. And trust me, lots of people did some diabolical acts. And 
saying I was just following orders is no excuse. So, sweetheart, if you really, really, really honestly think that children pretending to be Indians and pilgrims and acting out getting along and sharing food is a bad thing. Wow, woman. Wow. Because seriously, the, when they first came over here, pilgrims, whatever you wish to call them, Quakers, I don't know. When they first came over here, if it wasn't for the indigenous peoples, those that already lived here, who'd already been through winters, the, the newcomers would not have survived. Oh. Damn. Pinterest is not ped pedagogy. What the hell is that? In any case, so how did one observer react to this craziness? It appeared that most comments on her tweet affirmed her position, but A.P. Dillon, who's a Wake County parent and local conservative blogger, tweeted Saturday that the school district should appropriate academic instruction and drop the social justice worry of virtual signaling. Dillon added in a blog post Sunday that our betters... Um, over at Equity Affairs, our virtue signaling on Twitter about that teacher who might be having kids dress up as pilgrims and Indians. Spare us your finger wagging virtue signaling crap, Miss Mascarenas. She also said parents need to wake up to the school board's leftist social justice indoctrination. Which, yeah. So, how did Miss Karenna? Karenas respond? Well, the news and observer said that on Monday, uh, she didn't respond to the email, voice message, or direct message requesting comment. However, she tweeted a quote Monday night from Audre Lorde, a self-described black lesbian mother warrior poet who dedicated both her life and her creative talent to confronting and addressing injustices of racism, sexism, classism, and homophobia. Audre Lorde, honey, why do you have to describe yourself with all of those lovely little labels? Why can't you just be Audrey? All of those other little descriptives really are not that big of a deal. But apparently her res the little quote that was borrowed was, when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard or welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak. Yes, my dear, go ahead and speak and then let your words stand. And then justify them if they need justification. Or if they are actually truthful, they need no justification because the truth doesn't need to be supported. It just is. So, what else has Mascarenes been involved in? Well, the paper said that she's a former elementary school teacher who was a teaching and learning specialist at Teaching Tolerance, a project of Southern Poverty Law Center. The Wake County School District hired her this spring after it expanded its Office of Equity Affairs following a slew of racially charged incidents involving schools and students. That's according to News and Observer. She also wrote an article for Teaching Tolerance's fall issue about how schools can reduce the risk of undocumented students being deported. Mm. And the paper said, <clears throat> that's according to what the paper said at least. Now, Brad, Brent Woodcox, who is a Republican staffer at the General Assembly, said conservatives should work toward understanding her point of view. Really? One of the things conservatives have to do on cultural issues like this it, um, in Wake County is grow up, listen before speaking, and try to understand someone else's perspective. Okay, Mr. Woodcox. How about the other side learn to grow up just a wee bit as well? Now, it doesn't mean you have to agree, but show grace and learn something. Okay. Um, most of the time, I do show grace. Most of the time, y'all have no idea how many times I have bit my tongue. 
I'm surprised I have one left. But do not demand of me behavior that you are not willing to practice as well. Okay? Do not demand respect if you are not behaving in a manner that is respectful. Now, it does go on to say, or like the audience members who watch the kids' performance um, or perform a politically correct Thanksgiving pageant on Jimmy Kimmel Live a few years ago, uh, <clears throat> they may laugh at the title a little bit, but yeah, a politically correct Thanksgiving pageant. What the hell? What the hell? And there is a video attached at the end of this. Seriously, people? Yes. Yeah, Brent Woodcock. Mm hmm. I think, well, one time it's spelled. Let's see. Let me double check this. Nope. Grimmy, it's spelled with an X, not a CK. <laughs> oh, the things that you could say. But I will not. I will behave myself. I will bite my tongue. Okay. Let me put this over here. Ooh. Wanna just shared a. <coughs> uh huh. Thank you for those links, Wana. I'll have to check them out when I get done on the radio. Okay. Let me put this over here in the effing site real quick. And those of you listening on realliberty.org, I will get them pasted over there after I get done on the radio. It's just so much easier over here on this effing site. Because, um... Yeah, I have emojis. I don't have to actually think and type something while I'm talking because, yeah, yeah. Can you say squirrel? I think you can. Yeah, we'll do this one. Okay. Back to my pocket I go. Um, let's see. Where do I want to go next? I put all kinds of stuff in here, and then I had all kinds of craziness. Oh, here we go. I saw this one the other day. Um, this, and I don't remember who shared it now, but thank you. I think maybe Grim. It's from neonnettle.com. Nobel Peace Prize could be stripped from Obama and handed to Trump instead. Now, I'm thinking neon nettle is probably along the same lines as the onion. Which is cool, but, you know, what the hell. I saw the headline and I went, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to have to go there. You know I am. So... For many, it was a total surprise that former POTUS Dengleberry was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize back in 2009 after he was only in office a few months. Oh, but he brought peace to the world because he was the first black popo. POTUS. No, he did not bring peace. He brought pieces. Different spelling. Sounds the same. What's different? One of them is calm and serene. You can actually hear butterflies and smell flowers. The other is lots of booms and lots of rubble. But we're going to bomb democracy into you. Yay. The bully mentality. More means we win. Now, the Norwegian Nobel Committee chose to honor Dangleberry almost 10 years ago for his extraordinary efforts to strengthen international diplomacy and cooperation between peoples. <laughs> yeah, because he was a, <coughs> a uh, coordinator, facilitator. He was, he was a paper pusher and a schmoozer, an ass kisser. That's pretty much what he was. So... The decision could soon be reversed, though, due to opposition from various political figures, civic leaders, and authors. 
Rumors are now swirling around the British media that Dangleberry may see his prize withdrawn in the light of another world leader, uh, Myanmar's Aung San Suu Kyi, who recently lost Amnesty International's highest award. Okay. Oh, I'm. Thank you, Grim, for correcting me. Thank you. Yes. I forgot Bill Clinton was the first black prez. Thank you, hon. Damn it. Now, the AI se uh, Secretary General notified Aung San Suu Kyi, her 2009 Ambassador of Conscience Award, was revoked on the 11th of November. Just like Dangleberry, who was a Nobel Peace Prize recipient, um, Kai was condemned by almost half a million people who have signed a petition to strip her of the award. Hey, there's that $28,000 spell. It's stripping her. <laughs> huh. Now, this, according to Sputnik, while opposition to Dangleberry's prize may see a resurgence, the support for the current U.S. POTUS to get the Nobel Peace Prize recently saw fresh backing by U.S. lawmakers. Really? Really? A group of American politicians has signed a resolution in support of the current U.S. POTUS getting the prize in 2019. The politicians said that Trumpel's efforts on peace deal with the Korean Peninsula deserved the Nobel Committee's recognition. Obama got the Nobel Peace Prize when he hadn't even taken office yet and did absolutely nothing, said Ohio Republican Representative John Becker, one of the signatories to the resolution. And according to Ladbrook, Ladbrokes, an online betting site, U.S. POTUS Donald Trump Stilskin is second in the betting at a 5-2 to two odds of him winning. Now, back in June, Trumples was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, following his recent historical meeting with North Korea's Kim Jong-un at the Nuclear Weapons Summit. Finally, he met someone with a worse hairdo than his. Sorry, Trumples, but dude, the comb over? Mm, no. Not a good look, hun. And, well, orange. No. No, you're working on the whole Oompa Loompa thing there. Cut it out. Cut it out. Your, your wife needs to have a chat with you. Now, Trump was put forward for the coveted honor by two politicians in host nation Norway. Uh, per Willy Amundsen and Christian Tybring Gjid. Oh, circles, you're going to have fun with this one. Laugh your butt off, girlfriend. They explained how Trump took a huge, a huge, <laughs> a huge and important step towards peace in the Korean Peninsula, something no other POTUS has achieved. Well, okay. Hmm. And there's a link down here for those of you that have, you know, are so inclined. 13 amazing women who actually exist in the world. Okay, who cares? I did hear something the other day or see something the other day about Fakie Book is having some serious stock market issues. Serious. Like people are losing confidence. Hmm. Hmm. Shockers. Okay. Um. Hmm. And yes, Meister Brower, he does. Far as I know. Um, what you talking about, Wana? Oh, okay. <clears throat> the video link he shared. Okay. No worries. So, whether this is true or not, whether it's some faker, faker, belly acre, or some spoofy thing, or whatever, it's, I still find it amusing. I don't think Dangleberry should have gotten the Nobel Peace Prize to start with. All it did was inflate his ego even more. 
So, yeah. And he's already got a quite inflated ego. Hey. Let me look over here. Yes. I have a notification. Ah. Okay. Oh, and Justin put that Gab is a lot like mine. It's a lot like Twitter and doesn't center, censor. Ah. Okay. Yay, and Michelle is over there trying to learn the ropes. Hey, Michelle, over here on realliberty.org, I hope. How cool is this? Hi, cowboy, I see you over here on RLO. And uh, Anthony joined us over here. Hi, Ant, how you doing, hon? Okay. Back to my pocket I go. I did. I shoved a lot of stuff, and I'm surprised I could move. I shoved so much stuff in my pocket. Okay, now that we've had all of this craziness, all of this nonsense, all of this madness, let's go with something I found over on, well, which one do I want to go with first? I think I'll go with Eckert first. Over on Mines. You know more than you think. But is your thinking that prevents you from knowing what you know? That's from Eckhart Tolle. Also from him is, <clears throat> so it's the power of now. So when you listen to a thought, you are aware not only of the thought, but also of yourself as the witness of the thought. A new dimension of consciousness has come in. And as you listen to the thought, you feel a conscious presence, your deeper self behind or underneath the thought, as it were. And the thought then loses its power over you and quickly subsides because you are no longer energizing the mind through identification with it. This is the beginning of the end of involuntary and compulsive thinking. So when a thought subsides, you experience a dis discontinuity in the mental stream or a gap of no mind. At first, the gaps will be short, a few seconds perhaps, but gradually they'll become longer. And when these gaps occur, you feel a certain stillness and peace inside of you. This is the beginning of your natural state of fe excuse me, felt oneness with being, which is usually obscured by the mind. With practice, the sense of stillness and peace will deepen. In fact, there is no end to its depth. And you also feel a subtle emanation of joy arising from deep within. The joy of being. And you know what? When you get yourself so totally enmeshed with a thought process, with a belief system, you have all kinds of clutter going on in your brain. But when you, when you let go of habitual thoughts, I'm not saying that you need to just, you know, go with whatever, but you need to examine a lot of these habitual thoughts that you've got, whether it's a belief in authority, belief in a religion, belief in, in um, Santa Claus, what have you. If you let go of those things, you know, or at least let a little room in to observe them and, you know, ponder them. See if maybe that really does work with work for you. You'd be surprised at how, how light you feel and how you don't get so upset by what other people say because it's just their beliefs. It's a thought that they've made a habit of thinking. And when they get tired of that habit, they'll drop it. I dropped a lot of them. I still have some bad habits. Can't have, can't get rid of all of them. But, oh crap, I didn't mean to close that. Chite. 
project. Now, another one from Minds. Um, just because, just because. Um, <clears throat> anarchy. An from the Greek without the absence of, and the Greek noun archon, master or ruler. Anarchy does not mean without rules. It literally means without rulers. So, internal and external anarchy and monarchy. This is from I Am. It was posted today over here on Minds. Anarchy, <clears throat> no ruler. Monarchy, one ruler. So, when there is internal anarchy, when a being does rule the kingdom of the self, do not know thyself, no rulership over their internal kingdom, no understanding of the components of their consciousness and how they manifest the reality that they experience, they are not a sovereign. They are not monarchs either. Of, or they are not monarchs of self. The one ruler of self, internally of yourself, the only thing you are allowed to be ruler of there will be external monarchy, a force that wants to rule over that being as its one ruler. Now, a monarch ruling over the anar anarchist being an internal state. And the more of us in internal anarchy, the closer we progress towards external monarchy. The more of us that become true monarchs of self internally, in that kingdom there is only one ruler each individual. When that happens, each person is a sovereign ruler over their own consciousness. Then there will result external anarchy. There will be no rulership over other individual beings. That is the great work to make the process happen within the beings on this planet. So knowledge is seeking truth. It's the initial expression of love through natural law, and it's seeking truth and the desire to know, which is eventually manifested as knowledge and understanding of certain truths. Love is the force that expands consciousness and wants us to look at the truth contained in reality, what is, and allow us to expand our conscious awareness. Love is seeking truth. And love is truth. Now, ignorance, on the other hand, is refusing truth. It's the opposite or negative initial expression of fear through natural law and is the ignorance of not wanting to know and actively refusing knowledge and truth. Ignorance contract conscious awareness. Ignorance is based in fear. Knowledge is based in love. Ignorance prevents an understanding of natural law and the root causal factors of our condition. Freedom comes with knowledge of truth, and ignorance leads to enslavement. And I do agree with Mark Passio. I should be pronouncing that ignorance. Now, as for the internal expressions, there are essentially two states of rulership, a monarchy of one ruler or anarchy of no ruler, and the ex ex internal expression of the expansive force of consciousness manifests as internal monarchy or one ruler. This is known as sovereignty, self-control, self-dominion, self-mastery, self-governance, self-ownership, and self-rulership of one's own thoughts, emotions, and actions. The contractive force of consciousness manifests internally as anarchy. It's a person is in oppositional duality consciousness that does not rule themselves and is not sovereign because they are confused due to the ignorance of truth. Now, a sovereign is an internal monarchy. From the Latin super meaning above or over, and regnum meaning rule or control. A sovereign is being 
<clears throat> excuse me, is being a ruler over no other but our own kingdom of self. Our thoughts, emotions, actions are in unison, harmony and non-duality. Our thoughts are in a state of intelligence. Our emotions are in a state of care. Our courage has given us the will to act in proper moral ways in the world. We become united, whole and one within ourselves so that we are not in internal contradiction, opposition, and conflict. A sovereign exists in degrees as well because it's difficult to become a being that is completely unified with truth and act in harmony with it and themselves. Society is currently constructed to ensure that we're not fully capable of uniting with the truth and ourselves by having us agree to live in a certain way that is contrary to principles of truth in order for us to survive in this current modality of living. Now internal anarchy is basically confusion and confusion is a state of fractured and broken up internally as we are not in harmony and unison with ourselves. This condition is a result of not knowing and understanding what is going on inside of us because we have not looked at ourselves in full honesty and self-respect. We do not know our own psyche and consciousness and so we act and behave in contradiction to our thoughts and emotions, which is an internal oppositional state of consciousness. Ignorance breeds confusion through a lack of acquisition of truths to bring greater clarity and understanding in one's life. So acting against truth is the same as acting against ourselves because what is right, good, and true is what is best for us. Our freedom, prosperity, peace, and everything good. We are in a opposition of our own self. Internal disorder creates external disorder, as above, so below, as in the micro, so in the macro. The internal is reflected onto the external through the hermetic principle of correspondence. And the state of internal anarchy is someone not ruling themselves and their own house. It's a condition of internal confusion, opposition, contradiction, adversity, non-accordance, inconsistent, incoherent, incongruent, non-integrated, disunited, disharmony, and duality. That's an awful lot of adjectives. Now, the less we are in capacity to or the less we are in a capacity to rule ourselves with a lack of knowledge or internal opposition through attainment of truth to bring us the clarity and understanding to make right action decisions and choices the more easily we can be manipulated from without to taking wrong action and choices. Now I'm doing this basically because we have covered quite a few things where there's an awful lot of internal anarchy going on in this world. And people need to understand that you're not doing yourself any favors with this. I know this is kind of convoluted, but so with the external expressions of love and fear through natural law, they manifest as freedom and control in our lives. Freedom is external anarchy. Freedom is external anarchy where no one is a ruler of anyone else. There are neither masters nor slaves. Everyone has equal rights and expresses their consciousness by living in harmony with natural law principles of truth. No one accepts the false beliefs of ownership over another living being. There is no delusion of thinking that one has the right to control the actions of others who are not violating the natural law rights of another living being, such as is currently manifested through the institutions of police, military, and government, and schools. 
Those who work for and support these institutions are violating natural law every day. Now, control equals external monarchy. And it's based in the force of fear that results from the con contraction or limitation of consciousness. That consciousness is prevented from expanding through the force of love when people choose to be willfully ignorant and refuse the truth. This creates a state of internal anarchy and confusion leading to the desire to exercise external control over others. Don't you say that, that gives me a butt hurt. Don't you act that way. External control. So as more people accept the fear-based consciousness and desire control, this centralizes power and external monarchy manifests, i.e. governments. We're heading into one, <clears throat> this one world government of an external monarchic or monarchic rule force ruling of everybody. And it is this fact that enables the uh, hermetist to transmute one mental state or one mental state to another along the lines of polarization. Things belonging to different classes cannot be transmuted into each other, but things of the same class may be changed, that is, may have their polarity changed. And it will also be noticed that even to those unfamiliar with the principle of vibration, the positive pole seems to be of the higher degree than the negative and readily dominates it. The tendency of nature is in the direction of the dominant activity of the positive pole. So, right equals correct equals true equals moral equals natural law equals har no, no harm done equals good. Wrong equals Incorrect equals false equals immoral equals not natural law equals harm done equals evil. This was originally from Luminous Sovereign on Tumblr. So thank you I am for sharing this and thank you Luminous Sovereign for writing it. Luminous has a tendency to go on a bit but that's okay. I think we all need to realize that if we rule ourselves, we don't need someone else to rule us. So, learn to control yourself. My goodness, I can't tell you how many times my mom said, would you just get control of yourself? Yeah. My mommy was very good at letting me know that. You need to control yourself. Okay, now that I've done my little lecturing thing on that, let me go check out the pig real quick. And then I think I have one more that I want to get to tonight before we go to Turkey, Turkey, Turkey Day, because yeah, tomorrow is Turkey Day. I hope you don't eat too much, and it's not the turkey that's making you go to sleep. It's everything combined. By the way, yeah, Gary L. and apparently don't eat romaine lettuce. <sighs> you know, it's not necessarily the lettuce that's bad. It's, what's a, it's what they put on it. You know, like whatever the fertilizer was or, yeah, what they sprayed on it, what it was grown in. Yeah. You really need to be careful where you get your food. But apparently you're supposed to stay away from salads. So let's all eat lots of pie tomorrow. <laughs> I'll be working, but eh, that's okay. Over here on PIGazette.com, their word of the day is temporary. It's a flexible nanny state time span that starts when the heat in the kitchen reaches critical mass and ends the day after the next selection. 
in their quotable quotes section. Nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful people with talent. Genius will not, because unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. That's from Calvin Coolidge. So, moving along to the, oh, he's got a new steaming load. Wow. You guys will have to just come over to PIGazette.com and check out the steaming loads and all kinds of other fun stuff that Hambo and Porcus have been up to. Now, this date in history, the 21st of November, 1837. Your bored, deranged Aussie slacker who is tired of watching those damn kangaroos. So... You kill some time by skipping rope 22,806 times. Really? Wow. And finally, this date in history, the 21st of November, 1871. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's a daredevil named Emilio Onra, who goes airborne as the first in a long, illustrious line of human cannonballs. Wow. Wow. I wonder if he survived. Ugh. That 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 takes some way woes. Damn. Seriously. Um Oh my goodness. Okay. There um Let's see. In their top story this week, American Identity. Hmm. That's not what we are. It's the mantra du jour of the American left. And it's their way to redefine what it means to be an American, as if they have a clue about that. It's their knee-jerk response after the opening barrage of name-calling fails when confronted by their arch enemies, common sense and objective reality. Yeah. Redefine the American identity? Yep, it's the kind of shit they do. I doubt that they'll do any better than Thomas Jefferson's soaring praises. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. That's what we are. That's what we are supposed to be aspiring to. And that doesn't just apply to people in the United States. I think that applies globally. We all have the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And they are listed in that order for a reason. Because above all, you have a right to live. And if you, you, know, you also have a right to liberty. Unless your liberty infringes upon others' right to live. You also have the right to pursue happiness unless your pursuit of happiness means depriving others of liberty or life. It's in that order for a reason. And governments do not need to be institutions. Governments can be internal monarchies where you govern yourself. Just saying. So, especially considering tomorrow is Thanksgiving here in the United States. Yeah, be thankful that you have a mind. Be thankful that we live somewhere where we're supposed to 
we're supposed to be able to be free. <laughs> there you go, Graham. Yeah, I don't like the old government either. I want a new government. I want a new government of individual internal monarchy. That's what I want for a government, where everybody governs themselves with those three defining principles, the right to life, the right to liberty, the right to pursue happiness in that order. Be thankful that those words were put down and that's something that we can aspire to. Because there's an awful lot of countries that, quite frankly, don't have that as... And I think it, it needs to be a global thing. Everyone has a right to life. Everyone has a right to liberty unless it is known and a fact that their liberty infringes upon someone else's right to live. Everyone has a right to pursue their own happiness unless it is factual that that happiness, that pursuit of happiness is going to infringe upon someone else's or take away someone else's liberty or life or their own pursuit of happiness for that matter. We live in interesting times, my children. We really do. And we need to grow up. And we need to start making sure that what we demand for ourselves, we also demand that others get it as well. This whole crap of, I demand. Well, if you demand it for yourself, then by golly, you should demand it for everyone else equally. Now... One more thing. I think I have time for this one. Not real sure how long it is. It's from dailyinspirationblog.wordpress.com and it is the science that science ignores. And the plural of anecdote is not data. So, science aspires to be an all-encompassing way of looking at the world. Some scientists are Christians or Buddhists, but for many, science is their religion. Many people who are not professional scientists have also taken the scientific worldview to heart as an overarching paradigm of how the world works that leaves little wiggle room for an omnipotent deity to hurl his Olympian thunderbolts. We don't believe in miracles. Well, I say we because I am a scientist and I number myself in this group and science is the foundation of my worldview. But does the community of professional scientists auth authentically embody the scientific worldview? But has science, as it is practiced today, um, retreated from the aspiration to explain all that can be explained, but has our common notion of the scientific world become identified with a kind of mechanistic reductionism, even as quantum mechanics, which is the deepest and most successful scientific theory in history, is holistic at its core? Modern science is a career for a select few million people around the world, and to an extent, we don't like to recognize our research projects are driven by business considerations. Can we get funded to do this? Does our lab have the resources to address this question? Can this question be encapsulated in a project with an endpoint clear enough to make a suitable dissertation topic for a grad student? At the center of my concerns is the computer revolution. Computers have made possible some kinds of science that were not possible as recently as 50 years ago. We routinely shift or sift through vast amounts of data to find an outlier, and we imbue it with meaning. A hundred years ago, physicists focused their attention on the small subset of simple equations with analytic solutions. 
When I went to school in the 1960s, there were entire courses on the tricks that could be used to solve differential equations in a long list of special cases. Now we solve, solve systems of equations numerically and plot the results in a few minutes, not even bothering to check whether any of these tricks are acceptable or applicable. Even in pure mathematics, computers are performing proofs that involve checking out more cases and more bookkeeping and more symbolic manipulation than any mortal human could perform without succumbing to boredom and its consequence, error. The danger now is that the tools have begun to direct the science. We collect data not because we think it will help to answer a question of vital interest, but because we can. We've stopped asking the questions that cannot be addressed by collecting more data. And the greatest loss, in my opinion, is that we've dismissed whole classes of observations as anecdotal evidence and refused to take their message to heart. Among these stories, and one-off observations, there are many that call our fundamental assumptions into question, and scientists, like most humans, become uncomfortable when it appears that their fundamental assumptions may need to change. We're committed to our research agendas and don't like distractions. Damn the torpedoes and full speed ahead becomes, please don't confuse me with the facts. We don't want to look down to notice that the reasoning on which our science is based has cracks in the foundation. We've become reluctant to ask the kind of questions that computers cannot help to answer. Too many scientists have developed a contempt for what they call anecdotal evidence and compelling stories that are the driving force behind our curiosity. The belief that sets or the belief that sets of numerical data are the only kind of observations that science should consider. What would they have made of the one-off observation of Michelson and Morley in 1887 that gave Einstein the idea for relativity? Humans set our roots in stories. And these usually take their force precisely from their unique, irreproducible nature. My first kiss. A July snowstorm during my honeymoon in the Alps. Trying to calm the tears of my youngest daughter by the side of the pool. Oblivious to the fact that my older daughter lay unconscious at the bottom of the pool a 1979 scientific meeting at which I was taken under the wing of a Sufi master. Many scientists and more administrators have come to believe that if it can't be reproduced, science can't study it. Indeed, if a surprising new result is reported in a journal, other labs will try to reproduce the experiment, and if their results differ, the new result is dismissed as a mistake. Many journal editors have the idea that it's more conservative to avoid printing something that turns out to be wrong than to allow open discussion of speculative new science. Hence, if a submitted manuscript goes against what they believe to be true, they will refuse even it, it the space in the journal and the opportunity for discussion that it provides until the result has been replicated by more than one lab. You can't do science if you're afraid to be wrong. The business model of maximizing prospects for success is fundamentally incompatible with the conduct of science. All this is insidious because it looks from the outside as though science is thriving. It's not just more and more articles in more and more journals. Technological breakthroughs are coming along at a pace faster than society can accommodate them. 
The number of things that we can do now that we couldn't do 20 years ago is truly dizzying. But this success at the top blinds us to the void at the bottom. There have been no fundamental new discoveries in science since I was a child. First half of the 20th century brought us relativity, quantum mechanics, the new synthesis of Darwinian evolution with Mendelian genetics, the expanding universe, the double helix, the incompleteness theorem of Godel, or Goodell, the three degree microwave background, and the Big Bang. The last of these was in 1964. Has there been any comparable discovery in the last 50 years? The biggest danger is that we take the lack of fundamental new discoveries as evidence that our basic understanding is now correct. That we have discovered the large principles that govern life in the universe and it remains for us now to build on this solid foundation and fill in the details. This attitude could spell the death of science. So, what exactly am I talking about? Where is the glaring evidence that science is ignoring to its peril? Here's my list of 10 areas of reported observation that will change the face of biology once they are addressed. Number one, the origin of life. We are accustomed to think that four billion years ago, somewhere on Earth, a set of chemicals appeared by chance that just happened to be able to create copies of itself. But decades of trying to find such a combination points to an unbridgeable gap between the most complex system that could have arisen by chance and the simplest system capable of autocatalyst. Um, number two, uh, the anthropic principle. We think of such numbers as the gravitational constant and the mass of the electron as fundamental constants of nature that just happen to be what they are. But since the 1960s, it is clear that these numbers are very special. And if any of them were just a little bit different, the universe would be a dull place indeed. Number three, evolvability. Evolutionary biologists now accept that not just any self-reproducing system is capable of evolving. So how did life get to be evolvable? Evolvability must have evolved. But this requires a mechanism not encompassed by survival of the fittest. Number four, the Lamarckian inheritance. So I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, but does the giraffe who stretches to reach the uppermost leaves have children with longer necks? Evolutionary biologists have rejected this idea since the government tainted research of uh, Trofim Lysenko in the 1930s. But Lamarckian epi epigenetic inheritance has now been well established and all the pieces are in place to support the plausibility of the thesis that plants and animals can alter their genetic legacy as well. Number five, where is memory? The conventional answer is that memory dwells in the brain specifically in synapses that connect neurons. But one-celled ciliates demonstrate learning. Plants have memories, but no neurons. Monarch butterflies somehow, somehow pass the memory of their overwinter location through six generations of offspring each summer. And some heart transplant recipients have been reported to acquire the memories of the deceased donors. I've actually watched some videos about that and it really is kind of weird. Number six, plant communication. The forest is not just a free-for-all of individual trees, each trying to outdo its neighbors in height so that it can grab a bigger share of the sunlight. 
Trees send fer, um, pheromonal signals to warn of invading browsers and insect pests. These signals are picked up and acted upon by trees of other species and by birds. Trees pass nutrients to each other through fungal filaments underground and take turns nourishing one another through years of sickness. Fascinating. Number seven, animal migration. A homing pigeon depends on the Earth's magnetic field for part of its navigational ability. But a pigeon can be put in dark, magnetically shielded box and carried a thousand miles from home and within minutes after its release it will begin flying towards home. Whales and some ocean fish navigate over thousands of miles to a specific destination though they can't see more than a few feet in front of them. Crabs and turtles and butterflies congregate in swarms at times and places that they are somehow able to agree upon though they are separated by hundreds or thousands of miles. Number eight, telepathy, telekinesis, and precognition. These are credible science of parapsychology that has been pushed to the fringes by well-meaning realists who, whose theories have made them arrogant. Robert John, Dean Radin, Daryl Bim, Julia Mossbridge, Jessica Utes are among the most careful and meticulous of researchers in these phenomena, and all of them have experienced ridicule and ostracism from the scientific community. Number nine, the hard problem. What is the relationship between the brain and our consciousness? The conventional view is that brains produce consciousness. The mind is what the brain does. But already 120 years ago, William James taught us that there is another alternative that is less consistent with our paradigms, but more consistent with the facts. Maybe the brain is a transmission organ that connects the world of thoughts, feelings, and intentions to the material world of molecules, cells, and bodies. And finally, number 10, visitors from other worlds. There are so many stories of sighting UFOs that these people can't all be nuts. In 1997 over Phoenix, Arizona, a hundred thousand people saw an object the size of a battleship hovering in the air for hours, my mother included. She was in Phoenix at the time. Many government insiders tell stories that the U.S. military has been hoarding reverse-engineered alien technology since 1947, while using disinformation, ridicule, and murder to keep their secret intact. So, what do you think? Are there just entirely too many things out there that science needs to be checking out, but they just plain aren't because they just can't get the funding? I think so. I think so. Oh, life is so very interesting sometimes. And it's nice to see a scientist. I, I started trying to listen to a video of a... A guy who said he was a physicist, and um, he was also into transcendental meditation and a few other things, and I'd, I just couldn't listen for that long. I just couldn't. I, I think I made it half hour, 45 minutes max. He had such a fast way of talking and very monotone. So it's like, oh, my Lord. I'm going to sleep and I'm not understanding a single bit of what you're saying other than, okay, I take that back. I did understand whenever he said transcendental meditation. I knew that because that was becoming the thing when I was in high school. I think my senior year of high school or whatever. But, yeah, I'm telling my age here. So, science really needs to... Uh, 
step it up just a little bit and step away from these accepted, you know, climate change things with that hockey stick. You had errors in your equations. You threw away data that did not fit with your presupposed um, end result. And so now you're catching static. And yet, and yet, they're still trying to tax us because of cow farts and CO2, both of which, <laughs> well, you know, CO2, plants breathe. So, yeah, bunch of, bunch of nonsense. Scientists need to stop being so damn sure of themselves because that's the fun thing about science is somebody's going to come along any given Sunday and prove your theory, which is not a proven, it's a theory. Prove it wrong. Show you the holes in it. Even Einstein's theory of relativity is still a theory. Even the theory of gravity is still a theory. They're already picking holes in that one. And yet, when you put the word conspiracy with theory, all of the sudden, everyone who's involved is a nut job. Hmm. It is a crazy old wackadoodle world we live in. What was that over here in the RLM? Hootie doody weddy. Well, that's true, Graham. They don't. I hadn't thought of it like that. Grammy says scientists have no balls because if they ex espouse a theory that doesn't fit the mold, they are blackballed. Which, no, they still have balls, Grammy. It's just that they're very swollen and tender. <laughs> Ow! Oh, well. Y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com channel 10. Also on the RLM Spreaker channel. Once again, a reminder, I will not be around Friday night for the Rocket Chair. I will be doing family things because it is the time for giving thanks for that wonderful family of mine that, man, when we get together, I, I saw something um, in one of, I think in the Red Pill, um... Let's see, who was it that was saying, yeah, QFTW was, I think, was saying something about his mom, um, or maybe it wasn't in the red pill, um, having to deal with people that are very, very left-leaning, which, you know, you want to be left-leaning, that's fine. Just remember that you lean too far, you'll fall over. And those that are too right-leaning, Remember, you lean too far, you fall over. And those that are of the right wing and of the left wing, you need to stop and realize that you are the ones that are keeping the body of this government up. What would happen if you stopped flapping? I wonder. Oh, well. Y'all have an absolutely amazing rest of your evening. I hope those of you in the U.S. have an awesome Thanksgiving. If you're traveling somewhere, please be safe. Um, don't eat too much because, like my mother said, there are starving people in the world. And that's just really pretty freaking rude. And, yeah, I just, I, I can't, I can't eat that much. I got to get up and walk around. I'm more of a grazer at, how, at Thanksgiving anymore as opposed to sitting down. Give me a relish tray and some chunks of turkey and I'm good. Oh, well. Um, Friday, Grimmy, are you doing Freaker's Ball Friday night? Just uh, for curiosity's sake, since I have a couple minutes, I can wait until you respond. And Vinny, are you thinking about um, doing radio again, hon? You need to let me know when so I can... I mean, I'm so horrible at, at announcing everybody's unless... Unless I've been doing it for years, which, by God, I've been doing this for years. I have no freaking clue how long, but I know it's been years. <laughs> it's become habitual. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. In any case, um, Saturday, 
Hopefully, Flash Rooney at noon Eastern Time will be doing the dork table for all of you dorks out there. Sunday at noon Eastern Time, hopefully, Grimner will be doing the blues here in the RLM. And uh, should be a rousing game of trivia going on as well. Directly following Grim will be... Um, yes, I am broadcasting from space, Frumpy. <laughs> inner space in any case um let's see yeah hal anthony will be following grimmy on sunday with um he's going to open up a can of whoop ass on yo ass uh behind the woodshed so okay yes freakers ball on friday booyah and yes turkey day is only in the u.s or at least tomorrow it is i do believe thanksgiving or uh canada has a thanksgiving but they don't have it over in the uk i found that out when my grandkids were over there so yeah it's a it's a usa kind of thing in any case uh let's see flash rooney will also be on uh tuesday i believe it's noon eastern time with uh in a perfect wild yay flasher he's doing two shows Booyah for you. I don't know if he's got people that he's having as co-hostages or not, but booyah to you, Flasher. And shout out to Soikles because she puts up with him. In any case, thank you all for listening in. I hope you have an amazing rest of your weekend. I don't know how much I'm going to be on. So until we meet again, please remember, I truly do love you all. I am truly thankful that each and every one of you is in my world. And I wish you all enough. Good night.